Hi guys, and welcome back to Raised Teas, where we have conversations that matter with people who care. See, today, the only thing better than one Dr. Elder is two Dr. Elders. And today I'm joined by my cousin, Petal Elder, who is a physician currently working in the United States. So let's welcome Petal to Raised Teas. Thank you, Petal. so happy to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, now, I'm glad that not only are you... So today we're going to have a discussion about the COVID-19 vaccine. And what I love about having you on in particular is that not only are you a healthcare worker, but you're also someone with a master's degree in public health. And you're someone who's gotten the vaccine. So I feel as though your, your dis, the point of view that you're coming from is one that is very, very layered and informed <laughs> this says a lot more than a lot of other opinions out there what was that shay or no so i'm very interested to hear about your experience both working in the states and getting the vaccine um so first just for those who don't know you um where are you currently stationed and in what department sure again thanks so much for having me today and it's a pleasure so I am currently based at University of Massachusetts Medical School, Bay State Medical Center, which is located in Springfield, Massachusetts. So that's in Western Massachusetts. I'm in the internal medicine residency in the second year of that program, and I'm enjoying it tremendously. Love it. What are the COVID-19 statistics like over there? Like what? What is the situation like in Massachusetts at the moment? Yeah, so I actually have that written down for you. So right now, Massachusetts has more than 500,000 cases since um, March of last year, associated with about 14,000 deaths. And currently at, well, with Bay State for the past year up to now, We've hospitalized approximately about 2,701 patients with COVID, and we've seen approximately around 438 deaths. So uh, the cases have been significant, and we definitely have been battling a lot, and we're now also in another suit. Now, are you are you on the front, front, front line? Like, do you interact directly with COVID-19 patients? Yeah. So that's. A really good question. So I actually just finished my ICU shift as of Monday morning. I was on night and we were dealing with COVID patients. So ICU separated into two levels. So one level has the COVID patients that are intubated and requiring that level of critical care. And then the level upstairs is the non-COVID cases. So I've had that experience. Also last year, around March, end of March, when we were seeing the first in COVID, I also was spending my first time as an intern in the ICU. So I had very firsthand experience with dealing with COVID when the world really wasn't sure what this was. We weren't sure of what management, what treatment. We weren't sure of how to defend ourselves from the virus. So it was a very, um, informative experience almost like a battle so it's good to have seen it then because i think i got more resilience because of it but also now it's just completing icu i've been able to see how far we've come from from the level of care last year to this year understood yeah because last year we didn't have like it was just like covid numbers were now starting to peak so the policies that were coming from different health authorities were different and we were now gathering the personal protective equipment and the medications to be able to really fight this disease. Whereas now we have policies in place, we have enough protective um, gear and we are, are much more well equipped to, to battle COVID. And can you, just, can you just draw a picture for us in terms of what, somebody who's in the ICU secondary to COVID-19, what does that look like? What, what are their symptoms? What, what inevitably for those who don't make it what what are their final days like it's very dark and the experience has been quite traumatizing to be honest uh it's painful it's isolating in the icu that means you're intubated so you have this breathing tube 
stuff down your throat, going to your lungs, helping helping for you to breathe, helping give some support for the lungs. Some patients are able to be extubated, meaning getting the tube out and end up leaving the hospital. But others, unfortunately, don't make it that far, end up decompensating and passing away. So it's very hard. It's hard for the families. It's hard for the healthcare providers. And I would say one part of being a resident in the ICU that was extremely difficult for me was the communication with the families because they are not able to come into the hospital. They are terrified. You can hear the fear, the, the panic in their voices because they want to be at the patient's bedside but can't be. It's an unimaginable, like difficult experience and I don't wish that on anyone. And uh, just relaying that information to the, um, the families, um, trying to like, Tell, give them updates every day and then hearing them ask all these different questions and they, they want reassurance and they want promises but you can't give any promises um, because really once you have COVID do what you can for them but they're on their own timeline. Now I know that you stay up to date with what's happening back home what do you think about the measures that have been taken here in Trinidad and Tobago as relates to the pandemic? So I think Trinidad and Tobago did an excellent job. I am very impressed with the public health response and very happy. For example, the lockdown that was done, it was strict, but I think it was needed to protect Trinidadians and Tobagoans. Um, I, for one, haven't been able to come home since last February, and it's been hard not seeing my family, but I know that it's keeping people safe. And sometimes we have to be very very um, disciplined and very strict about how we go about things um, to ensure safety. Um, we have to put our own selfish needs aside and focus on what's the best for the population. So I think the lockdown has been pretty effective. Also, the, um, the, the masking once you're out in public and encouraging persons to wear masks, that has also been a great tool because that has shown to be effective in reducing the transmission as well as promoting the social distancing. And remember what the social distancing too, because I think at times people were a bit concerned as to what that meant, but it really is that physical distancing. And there's so many ways now that we can stay social via Zoom and <laughs> WhatsApp and whatnot. But um, that has also been something that I've seen promoted quite well within Trinidad. Um, so I've been happy with the public health response. Part of that public health response would inevitably be the introduction of, um, of a vaccine to the population. Now, at the time that this interview is being filmed, um, the vaccine isn't yet available to the public here, but it should be soon. Now, I know that you recently received both doses of one of the vaccines, and I know that receiving the vaccine is a thing that currently um, is a hot topic of debate in society in general yeah what was your decision making process like what how how did you yeah how i went about that yeah that's, making how did you go about making that decision yeah that's a really really good question so that decision was a difficult one um because i'm quite aware one of the the mistrust that exists between those in certain minority communities like the African diaspora community and healthcare, um, painfully aware of that. Um, also, there was concern about how fast the vaccine had been developed. So people raised issues with that, if we can trust this vaccine. But I decided to do the research, look at the literature, look at where the scientists had really sort of gathered resources to get this vaccine into effect. And by reading the literature, by attending these conferences that my residency program and hospital had for us around the vaccine, all of that was helpful because once you gained that information, you then were able to make a, a decision as you were well informed. Um, ultimately, I decided that I had the, the research which showed that this vaccine was effective um, up to 95%. I took the Pfizer vaccine, um, two doses of it. 
Um, yes, there were some side effects, but... Minimal, um, like a headache, um, sore arm, some cold-like symptoms. And I think once I saw the science, I sort of combined my science with my sort of um, emotional part of me too. <laughs> I use that to guide me. So I really took the vaccine as an effort to promote public health. So I took it out of respect for my patients because I need to protect them as much as I need to protect myself. Um, so me going into the hospital, yes, I wear a mask, yes, I wear the goggles, but I don't want that I transmit anything to my patients. Like I wouldn't be able to live with that guilt and that fear. Um, also to protect myself. So working in the COVID unit, I've had multiple experiences where I thought I had COVID and you would have to stay home from work, um, get tested, and that affects the efficiency of the hospital system. So I was like, I'm a frontline healthcare worker. I have to be at my best. And if I'm going to be at my best, I have to protect myself to the best of my ability. Um, and that includes getting the vaccine. I also took the vaccine because I felt like it was out of respect for all those who died from COVID-19 and weren't able to get this vaccine and patients and people all over the world and all the healthcare providers who also um, couldn't get this vaccine and died serving. So I thought that I was in, I'm in service and I have something that could protect me, I'm going to take it. I did think at one point, um, why should I take something foreign when I'm already young and healthy? And if I do get COVID, it's most likely for me being a young, healthy person that I may not suffer tremendous, like significantly from it, it will just pass. But then I realized that even though I may have a mild COVID case, I can still transmit that to someone who's in a vulnerable situation, meaning an elderly person, a person with comorbidities. And I need to do my part as a doctor and as a public health um, professional. So I got the shot. I took the shot. The shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I, and I appreciate that you, that you mentioned what side effects you did experience, because I do know that that's a concern that people have, you know, that they'll take this vaccine and sprout a third eye and wings. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, how do you any side effects for me? No, I know you said that the Pfizer vaccine, was it 95 or 97% effective? Yeah, I've read 95% effective in um, right. preventing no. COVID. But you have to feel free to fact um, check me. On yes, that yes, yes, yes. I'll put it <laughs> at the bottom. I'll send, put the, the actual statistic at the bottom yeah. of the screen. Petal and I then watched and discussed a recent controversial interview Dr. Anthony Fauci had with CNN's Chris Cuomo. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Section yeah. for you here. All right. Just some questions that keep coming up. Okay. Um, why do I have to keep wearing the mask after I get the vaccine? I thought it was going to protect me from the vaccine. Uh, what's the answer? Well, the answer is unless you get the overwhelming majority of the country vaccinated and protected and get that umbrella of what we call herd immunity, there's still a lot of virus out there. There's still a lot of virus out there. So just because you're protected, so-called protected by the vaccine, you should need to remember that you could be prevented from getting clinical disease and still have the virus that is in your nasopharynx because you could get infected. We're not sure at this point that the vaccine protects you against getting infected. We're not sure at this point that the vaccine protects you against getting infected. Like we know for like sure it's very, very good, 94, 95% in protecting you against clinically recognizable disease. Clinically recognizable disease, but not COVID? And almost 100% in protecting you for severe disease. And almost 100% from severe disease? Well then, what does he call COVID? if that's not serious. But until you have virus that is so low in society, we as a nation need to continue to wear the mask, to keep the physical distance, to avoid crowds. 
We're not through with this just because we're starting a vaccine program. We're not through with this just because we're starting a vaccine program. Even though you as an individual might have gotten vaccinated, it is not over by any means. We still have a long way to go and we've got to get as many people as possible vaccinated of all groups. How, what does that take? When are we fully vaccinated? Well, the projection that I've made, and, and I hope it works this way, it's going to depend upon the... So in an interview with CNN, Dr. Fauci is quoted as, say, as saying that the vaccine isn't going to prevent disease transmission, but rather lessen the symptoms if you get it. Did your research reflect this? And what is your opinion of the interview? Hi, yes, I 100% agree with Dr. Fauci. Dr. Fauci... Uh, oh. He's amazing, has been quite the leader. Um, so yes, basically we're vaccinated, but that's not the end of the story. We still need to continue protecting ourselves and protecting other people by wearing a mask um, when we go out. So the vaccine, it does lessen your chance of getting COVID-19. And it also, if you were to get COVID-19, it reduces the severity of the disease. Because remember, you can have a mild, form of the disease or well, you can have the disease but ma it manifests in a mild form um to a severe form like ending up in the icu and passing away so the hope is that by taking this vaccine you reduce um your chances of that severe um form of the disease um that being said you can still be a carrier of covid 19 you can still transmit it to other people so that's why we have to continue with the, the physical distancing and the, um, the masking. So Dr. Fauci, oh. 100%. Understood. And thank you for breaking that down because I, I do feel as though um, sometimes people don't always comprehend what medical professionals put out. So that I think one of the big criticisms he was getting in the interview is why people still have to wear a mask if they're vaccinated. And I think people don't understand that even though you are vaccinated, you can still be a carrier of the disease. It can still um, um, colonize your nasal pharynx and, it can, and you can still, even though you are vaccinated and you either may not contract it or may not get severely ill, could yeah. still take it to someone else. Yeah. Now... Okay. There's there's also growing concern surrounding the vaccine being an mRNA vaccine and mm -hmm. being the first of its kind used in a human population. Yeah. Do you share these concerns? Yeah, so that was something that was uh, raised by a lot of my colleagues that this is a new type of vaccine with the um, RNA, mRNA base that they used. And... I was initially concerned and that's what led me to research it and with the research it showed that it's still safe in terms of um, that um, time frame that they looked at the symptoms. Yes, we don't know the long term effects because no one has gotten the vaccine and we've seen how they are in 15, 20 years. But right. as, as far as we know, it, it is safe um, if we were to get it um, from when that timeline is. It is it's safe in terms of protecting you um, from getting COVID. Well, it reduces your chances of getting COVID and there are no short-term severe symptoms that um, occurred in a large number of people. That being you, said, sometimes there's right. correlation. So some people may like give, you may hear cases in the news, for example, of um, someone got the vaccine then had a, like, a heart attack the next day. And I, oh. But remember that the, we're getting the vaccines. Um, people are getting the vaccines, but life is still going to happen. Like, so you have to look at causation versus correlation. You are absolutely right. And if the, the the majority of people are getting this vaccine and feeling fine, and the um the data, the science shows that it, it's reducing the likelihood of it, then um, we should really trust in the science here and get vaccinated because it's the only way that we're going to restore any sort of 
um, society that we, we um, are safe from. Do you have any concerns about long-term effects? Long-term effects? Um, so honestly, I'm not sure because we haven't seen how that would play out. But just looking at other vaccines, um, so we've all taken so many different vaccines as healthcare providers in the, the US, for example, we have to get the flu vaccine every year. Um, we've all received vaccines as children. Um, young women get the HPV vaccine, three doses of that. So I think in the, the long run, it, it's, it's going to be safe. And most likely, I think it may end up like the COVID, the flu vaccine, because we have all these new variants coming out and it seems to be just transitioning and mutating that we may need to be getting this vaccine nearly every year, like because of resistance that may develop. That's my personal theory. Um, and I can't, I can't give you like a hundred percent answer about any um, long term effects, but we kind of have to face that bridge when we, when we reach there. When we get to <laughs> like, it. Right now, um, we're trying to just build a safer life for us and prevent people from dying and ensure your workforce is healthy. Um, and that's why I think people should get vaccinated. And I've gotten the two and I feel well. <laughs> understood, um, understood. Mm -hmm. Now you touched on it a bit earlier, yeah. but there is a lot of skepticism towards the vaccine, particularly in the Afro-Caribbean community and other communities of color. Yeah. Now this stems from a history of medical racism as well as experimentation on Black people like the Tuskegee experiment. What do you think about the skepticism and what do you think can be done to alleviate it? Yes, so that skepticism is real. There's a real fear, there's a lot of myths. I also had a lot of that fear. I told the friends that I don't want to be hospitalized here with COVID and end up as another statistic. Because if you look at the state, the brunt of the, the death and the morbidity from COVID-19, it's on the, the minority community and um, specifically African-Americans. Um, why is that the case? A lot of reasons. Um, chronic conditions like heart disease and diabetes, like a lot of the risk factors um, for COVID. Um, are also very predominant in the African-American community, but also sometimes a sort of hesitation to go to the hospital to seek care because they, people don't, oh, some people don't feel comfortable going to hospitals. So I think we have to, how we fix that, we have to acknowledge the past. We have to acknowledge that people of the African diaspora have a deep-seated fear of the medical institution. And we have to use role models, use um, like, you know, black physicians, black nurses, um, you know, like kind of reach out to them and see if they are, are willing to speak to their communities um, and really spread the message that we are here for you, um, that we care for you. We are in the medical field and, and hopefully by our example, um, they feel more comfortable and also delivering the message in such a way that you are able to reach the people who are hurt and um, are, are very cautious of, um, of medicine and tell them that this is a way of protecting themselves uh, and this, this is really a way of staying safe. And, and I think once we spread a message of like, that we care and we, we love everyone, um, people may be more willing to get it. And also the next thing is we have to continue doing more studies and involved um, with the study, the population that is very diverse. So um, um, ensuring that we have um, representation from all different people of ethnic backgrounds. Agreed and appreciate it. And, um, and I think, um, and I think part of, part of those studies, because I, I know that there was a study done on medicalized racism recently in the States. Um, I think part, part of not just doing these studies is also acting on the recommendations um mm -hmm. and and thus creating a medical environment where black and brown people people of color feel comfortable feel like they will be cared for and feel like the physician 
on the other end of the table, regardless of their color, um, has their best interests at heart and is and cares about them and cares about yeah. them. Yeah, I think I think that message of care is so important, and people just need to stop, like you know, like they just need to be less judgment on people in that community too, and because you know sometimes they may be like, oh, they don't want to take this vaccine and just you stop there. We have to figure out what, what are the reasons for why they don't want to take the vaccine and address those reasons. Um, and I think you have, to, you have to go to the community and you have to ask them what, what are their doubts. And when you get a list of those doubts, it's then up to us to figure out how to really address their, um, their um, hesitation. I think that's key. So there's a lot of talk now about vaccine hesitancy. Um, Petal, is there anything else? So thank you so much for coming on, Petal. Is there anything else you'd like to share with the VSTs viewers before you go? Um, I would say, you know, I think, oh, one thing is that mental health during this time. Like I am a wellness, you know, enthusiast. And I think COVID can take a real toll on your mental health. So just Take care of yourself, be gentle with yourself, rest when you can, um, eat well, try to get some exercise indoors or in a socially distant setting and just, you know, maintain hope that things will improve one day. And my love goes out to everybody. Lots of peace and well-being. <laughs> Thank you. But thanks Thank so much. You so for much. Thank you, Patel, and I hope to have you back on again. Certainly. Shout out yes. anytime, cuz. I'm very proud of all that you hear. Thank you. Represent. Right, guys, well, that's it for today's episode. Can't wait to catch you guys in the next one. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, and the bell notification. And until next time, bye. Okay.